Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Pause with me today, very special guest, former two-time TNA World Heavyweight Champion, of course, the former WWE United States Champion. He is Mr. Ken Kennedy, Mr. Ken Anderson. Welcome back to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you for having me. What is going on in your world? What have you been up to? Um, just training my students, um, trying to get my butt in shape a little bit. I decided that, you know, the pandemic really, um, it, it, it got me to be super lazy and I'm, I'm kind of over that, you know, and, uh, seeing my students succeed and, and helping them along in their journey is really motivating me to do the same. Where is your school? Like, wh what's the students like? Do you have a lot of students? Like, what's going on with the school? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, we, we've had, we've been open since 2016, minus two years with the pandemic. But uh, we're located in St. Paul, and we've got, you know, we've trained, I think, over the course of the last, you know, that time we've been open, I, I believe we've trained or, or seen come through our doors over 250 people. Um, obviously not all of them have graduated. Some people dip in, they dip their toe in the water and they realize that this, this hurts a little bit more than they thought. Right. Um, but yeah. And then I've got other students who have been with me since the beginning and they still train with me. Um, we don't like, you know, train them and kick them out the door. We, we could kick them out of the nest, so to speak, that we want them to go out there and, and tr get experience and wrestle and, do different things, but um, we hope that they come back and continue to learn. Because, to be honest, I continue to learn, and I learn from my students all, every every week. You know, so I think there's something to be said about continuing education. You know, so it's the academy still. Is that still the name? It is. Yes, sir. Because I remember the last time might have been about five years ago. You were on with uh, with me, and we were talking about it. I didn't realize it was still in the same. So still in Minnesota, still in the same exact place, and everything. It's a different location. Um, we moved from Minneapolis to St. Paul, um, but uh, we're in a great location now. We're inside a. It's a six thousand square foot facility. We don't have six thousand feet, but um, we've got a, a portion of that with our ring, and uh, it, it's it's basically it's a boxing gym. And it's, uh, you know, to quote The Rock, the Iron Paradise, there's a gym, there's a full weight room, there is, uh, there's a boxing ring, there's uh, boxing heavy bags, there's a basketball court, there's a dance studio, there's all kinds of things under one roof. When you train, are you training literally from the ground up, everything? I mean, that, that's what you do there? Yeah, for the most part, um, I take people that have no wrestling experience. And we teach them, you know, the foundation, taking a bump, hitting the ropes, um, locking up, things like that. But also we've trained people who are experienced who just wanted to get like some more polish and more more instruction. Um, you know, I think it's always good too once you've been trained by somebody to go and get somebody else's perspective on it, you know. And so we've had that happen uh, a few times. Do you like that they could also kind of pick your brain too? Like, like maybe some veteran guys or some experienced guys come in because obviously you've been to WWE, you've been to TNA. I mean, you've been around the block. Do you like that too? Like almost, you know, being able to be a mentor to some of these guys? Anger? I just like, I just, you know, I, when I broke into the business, I didn't know anybody that had made it in the business. Um, I just wanted to be able to like offer that to other people to, you know, I had to go out and make all the contacts myself for the most part and uh, do the, do the legwork. And I just wanted to be able to like sort of shortcut some of that process for people. So yeah, I do enjoy that. I that's anytime I can help somebody figure this business out a little better. Um, it's, I mean, that's my favorite thing about this business. Why did you get in to begin with? Like you said, you didn't really know what anybody was doing. Are you just a fan you wanted to get in? Yeah. I, I mean, from the time that I was a little kid, I wanted to be an entertainer, you know, like uh, I remember going to ET with my mom and like, how do I do that? I want to do that. I want to play that character. And at the time, my mom sort of said something and, and it wasn't like intentionally 
Um, she wasn't trying to cut my dreams or anything like that, but she, you know, she was like, it's really hard to get into. You have to live in a certain place. You have to know certain people. So I just basically felt like that'll never happen. And um, throughout my grade school and high school career, I was into acting and I'd always tell jokes and stuff like that at parties. And uh, I knew that I wanted to get into acting of some sort. And um, I, w I remember it wasn't until right when Austin was just building up to win the title at WrestleMania 14, spoiler alert for anybody, sorry, <laughs> um, that I really started watching. And I realized that like, here's a blend of all these things that I love. It's, you know, it's athleticism, it's showmanship. It's all rolled into one. And um, I was at a party one night and a friend of mine said, that he knew of somebody going to a wrestling school. And I guess I had just never thought like, how do these guys do this stuff? You know, like it had never, it had never dawned on me. And that's the, I couldn't think of anything else. And I, I went home immediately and I started looking for wrestling schools. So, you know, initially, yeah, I just got in because like, I loved watching and I thought like, I want to contribute to that. I think I can, I think I can do that. And then I realized like how hard it is once you can actually get into it. So Steve Austin is kind of uh, not your favorite, but maybe the guy you looked up to when you were getting in. Yeah, he's my favorite. Like really? just just from a from a nostalgia standpoint, like just that feeling that I got and that other people got when they watched him perform. Um, it just yeah, it was incredible. I remember and he was the like guy. He was the guy that I, I was at a friend's house and. You know, he said, we're watching wrestling tonight. And I didn't want to. And, and uh, he made me, he basically turned it on in the background. And he said, like, watch this guy. And then, like, I heard the glass break. And I saw this guy drive up to the ring in a pickup truck. And just his whole demeanor, the way that he carried himself, the way that he beat people up. It was different than all the other stuff for some reason, you know, like, and I just, okay, well, that guy's cool. And then I started watching week after week just to see what he would do. And then I got sucked into everything else. And before you know it, that's all I could think about. That's all I was talking about was wrestling. I remember going to some random house show in like 98 or 99. In, well, a couple of them, but one in Philly in particular, like a nothing show. But he's on the show. So there's 20,000 people there. And it's like pandemonium. I mean, it was like crazy. I was like, I thought this was like a throwaway show. It was like a nothing show. Like I was like, it was nuts just because of him. If he wasn't there, diff di different atmosphere. I mean, he's got the beer. He's beat Shane McMahon's. He's beating up Shane, beating up the boss man. <laughs> Vince ran, ran in. Like for some reason, Vince is there. I was like, oh, this is awesome. It, it was he just completely just changed like the whole demeanor, the whole building. I mean, just, it blew up as soon as he comes out. Yeah. I remember at my first wrestling show I ever went to my first WWF event was, uh, over the edge where I think the main event was Austin versus dude love. And McMahon was the, uh, referee and the stooges like Patterson and Briscoe were guest ring uh, timekeeper and bell ringer and and i think the undertaker was out there too for some doing something yep and i just remember like i had seen it on tv but when you see it when you experience it firsthand the the way that arena went insane when you heard that glass break it was just it's the coolest experience and i remember at the time looking at these matches and i didn't know how they were doing it but i was like they're, they know exactly when to do things so that people react to it. You know, like you could tell that they were, they were manipulating the audience and I was just fascinated by it. Like, how do they do that? So good. That match is awesome. Plus watching it at home, JR is just like over the top. Great. I mean, the crowd's going nuts, but him and then him, Austin and Vince, I mean, Literally the most like perfect time in wrestling. You had to be there though. I mean, people go, "Oh, I will go back and watch." Blah blah. It, go back and watch all you want. It's great, but in the moment, it's the best. It really was. Yeah, that was the uh, by my hand only thing, right? Where. Yep. Where Austin, Vince yeah. Yeah. Vince had to, so he gets knocked out with the chair, and he uses Vince's hand. Yeah. So yeah. 
great booking there too because you think it's like there's no way first of all briscoe's out there everything is set up for for foley to win and vince is the ref there's no way austin can survive it then all of a sudden undertaker beats up briscoe and patterson and then yeah. he vince gets hit with the chair and then he uses his hand as a fan you're like there's you're like fuck austin is screwed like there's no there's no way around it yeah. there was a way around it perfect it was such good booking the only thing i remember about that <laughs> as i remember seeing uh seeing vince peeking right like he was looking when the when the chair shot was coming that's the only thing i remember of it I took it with no that. hands either yeah right that, well that's the way that's the way we did it i mean when i broke in i was like you know you don't put your hand up don't put your hand up on a chair shot it doesn't hurt that bad and it's just not that bad and and you will uh you'll look like a wimp if you do so so people just didn't i'm glad now that we've changed that mentality though you know did really you even think about concussions and stuff back then or not you never thought about it no not didn't even give it a thought i remember i um i wrestled batista at the great american bash and he ran me into the post and i i split my head like right here there's this big scar right here um I like if you watch the match, it's sick, and I just start pouring blood. And I, I think I went to my hotel room that next. Uh, that was on a Sunday for a pay per view, and then Tuesday I wrestled Batista on on SmackDown. You know, just put a band aid on it. But we did didn't you, even think about it, and I like I'm not. It's not a complaint. It's just like that's just what we did. We didn't know any better. Did you think it was a concussion? You didn't even be like ah, I just got my bell rung kind of thing. Yeah, I didn't even think. I didn't it. The word concussion never even crossed my mind, honestly. Crazy now with like all the stuff going on, especially with Tua <clears throat> Tangaloa in uh, in uh, Miami. I mean, it's just been crazy. And then obviously Chris Nowinski, who's a former wrestler, he's all yeah. over it. And I mean, crazy what's going on. Then the, the the doctor got fired. I mean, concussions is like really hot but topic now. It really is. I mean, like I don't know. I I'm just I'm just rapping here. I don't know what the answer is, but like at some point, these guys know what they're getting into a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I know that there's a potential that I'm going to get a concussion when I'm wrestling, just anytime I'm wrestling. But I, I, you know, I, I'm not saying that like measures don't need to be taken, but like, how far do you go before do we play touch? Do we just get rid of football entirely? I mean, I'm not. Um, like, I don't know. I don't want my kids playing football for sure. You know, I guess if they want, if, if they really want to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them, but I guess that's a bridge we'll cross when we, when we get to it. But yeah, I don't know what the answer is. Um, it seems to me that other, maybe we take the pads off. What do you think about that? <laughs> I hope not, but well, uh, man. the thing is, is like, I watch AFL. Australian football, yeah, and I watch uh, rugby and other, and they're you know pretty high contact, not quite as high contact, but I think when you pad people up and you tell them that they they'll just um you know they lose their they they become uninhibited and they just like slam into each other as hard as they can, and I think maybe if you took the pads away, they wouldn't do that so much. I don't know. It seems like you don't have those problems in the AFL, Australian football, and uh, and around the world in rugby. Yeah, because they kind of use their helmets as a weapon, so to speak. A lot of the guys. So you're right. It's yeah. almost like it's almost like if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be able to use the helmet. Maybe you wouldn't be as aggressive. Right. Yeah. That. That's what I'm. You know. With that, NFL supposedly said that last year was the least amount of concussions recorded, but if you have a doctor like you had in Miami, maybe they're just not reporting the concussion. You know what I mean? So maybe like they're kind of fudging the numbers a, a little bit on that just, one. And just looking the other way. Sure. And I, that would be my guess, honestly, like um, these guys are, they're hitting each other harder than ever. You know, like I, I remember I didn't, I never played organized football when I was a kid, but I just remember hearing, um, schoolmates you know talk about like the coach just you just hit that person as hard as you can knock them out of their shoes if they get knocked out good for you 
you know? Yep. So, yeah, man, when I played, my coach was nuts, it, it, like in a good way, but also in a bad way, because I took this guy like complete out out the game. I mean, ended his career technically, and because a buddy of mine went to college with me, said he can't play anymore, whatever. But my coach was loving it. He was like, "Oh, that was awesome!" Like you know, star in the helmet, like all of a sudden. I mean, they you know they you know, they basically glorified how great it was, and they're just like, "Holy shit!" I think I took that kid. I don't think he can play. It right. just completely yeah. took him out. But the coach was loving it. He was like an animal, but. I know yeah. that different. I mean, that's twenty years ago. It's a different, different time, different, uh, different era. Definitely. These guys now are faster than ever. You know what I mean? Are you a Packers fan, by the way, or a Vikings fan? I'm a Packer fan. Yeah, I live in Minnesota. I've lived in Minnesota for like twenty years now. But like, yeah, I've always been a Packer fan. Um, I, I was going to say, um, not to change the subject here, but like, right. I was going to say that's one of the things that I really focus on at the academy is, um. I don't want guys like the old school method of, of bump a thousand times just to, just to see how bad you want it. Like, I just don't think that works anymore because every time I feel maybe it's not a concussion, but there is some, every time you hit the mat, whether you hit your head or not, like there is some rattling around that happens. And uh, I try to, you know, teach them the right way. We have crash pads and stuff that we we try to use just so that and, – and we haven't had – knock on wood, we haven't had any serious problems since we've opened. I don't think we've ever had anybody uh, complain of a concussion or anything. Do you think that that's like the, a bump card kind of thing? Like you only have so many bumps in your bump card. Let's not do a 1,000 here because we, we want you to be able to be clean, healthy, good when you're actually going to be wrestling in the ring. Exactly. Yep. Definitely. I, I was told that early on, you have a certain amount of like your, your body is a punch card and every bump you take, somebody punches. And, uh, I, I remember we were doing, uh, in, in my, in my school, when I started out, we were doing six packs off the top, you know, like the old flare bump where flare goes up to the top rope and the guy yep. throws you off. And, uh, I did that a couple times and I, I got it down and my trainer was like, okay, that's enough. And I was like, oh, I want to do a couple more. And I went up and uh, did another one. And he's like, okay, that's enough. And I just kept wanting to do it because it was fun. And he's like, uh, and then that's the first time he sat me down and had that bump card talk with me. And I didn't, uh, honestly, I thought I was invincible up until fairly recent. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm glad he had that talk with me and, Hopefully it gets through to some of my students nowadays. I think with what we know about what science knows about concussions and the, and the human body in general, um, you know, it's better overall. I feel like it's a different mentality with trainers years ago too. They almost don't want you to make it. Like you were saying, see, see how bad you want it, but it's almost like they secretly don't want you to make it because they make it life hard on you like if you do make it great but ah, let's hope you don't it's like a, a different mentality for sure it was I, I i definitely believe that um it was let's try to beat these guys into submission and if we have to if we start with 20 we want to whittle it down to two you know and i think that's partially laziness you know like um uh, i I say that for lack of a better word, just um, not wanting to train 20 people. You know, it's way harder to train 20 people than it is to train two people. Um, and I just, I don't have that mentality. And I feel like had I had that mentality, a lot of my students who are successful right now on the independent circuit wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have stuck around. Do you think that's a problem? Like, as far as like, or was a problem? Guys just don't stick around. For instance, WW Power Plant had Dave Batista, who you, you mentioned for wrestling. They had him. The training was insane. It was impossible. You got a grade A athlete here, you know, with the star power and charisma and the size and the look. And, you know, he's like a five tool player kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, you, they're like, no, 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 you know, we're not training you hard enough. And they keep pumping him, pumping him, and he quits. Is that like a you know that could be a bad thing too for sure. You lose out I, like you lose out on a huge talent like that. The, yeah, exactly. And like look at you know look at all the things that Dave has done outside of the wrestling business in the acting world that like we wouldn't have we wouldn't have been blessed with that you know. So I think that 
I don't know. I just try to meet people where they are and help them along. And some people learn faster than others and other people take like, you know, sometimes it's painfully, the process is painful, but um, when I see the light bulbs click on for those people, it's just as rewarding as when one of my students gets a tryout with WWE or, or has a dark match or, you know, something like that. Do you do a lot of promo and mic work? Obviously that was a huge strong point for you. Do you focus on that? We try to. So um, early on, um, this is the way it always goes early on in the classes because our promo nights are Friday nights. So early on, when they're just starting out, they come to all the Friday classes. And then as time goes on and they start getting booked on shows, then shows are occur on Fridays and Saturdays. So, so we're kind of like rethinking how we do this because I want to, I want to focus on the wrestling, the in-ring aspect, but also I want to make sure that people are getting the, the mic work too, which to be fair, that's the, the most nerve wracking stuff, I think to get up in front of a room of 10 or 20 of your peers and cut a promo is a really hard thing to do. It's hard to do it in front of a a bigger audience. I think it's even more difficult though, to do it in front of a small group of people, a really small group of people. And especially people that, that know you and are judging you. (laughs) Yeah. I've seen those videos of like Dusty Rhodes promo class and it's, you know, there's 10 or 15 guys, but he'll just randomly say a word or a phrase or something. And then it's yeah. like a curveball Cause you're like pencil, like, you know, like, what do I say? And then you have to see it's, it's really uncomfortable. Almost. You almost have to be yeah. comfortable being uncomfortable. Yep. I think it has, um, we've got an improv, um, comedian coming up in a month and, uh, in, in beginning of November, first weekend in November, we're doing an improv course, and it's going to be two days of just working with uh, the guy who that's all he does. He trains in improv. And I think that a lot of what we do in the business, well, it, it can be improv. It's not so much anymore. I think more and more today it's paint by numbers. You lay out exactly what you're going to do and then you go out there and you wrestle. But I think it's a really good skill to have to be able to just go out there and call it on the fly. Um Doesn't- doesn't that suck or, doing that? Like paint by numbers? Isn't it great calling it on the fly? Yeah, it really is. It's the, it's, it's one of those, like, it's super liberating. I remember the first time I worked with Undertaker. Um, I believe we were in Oklahoma city and it was just a house show. And he was like, I just want to feel you out. I just want to see if we have good chemistry. So he goes, just listen to me. Okay. And that's literally, that's, he said, I'm not going to call anything back here. We're just going to, I'll call it in the ring. Just listen to me, do what I tell you to do. And I, we went out there and I was, I, I imagine I would have been nervous wrestling the undertaker for the very first time, but I was so much less nervous because I didn't have to worry about remembering all this stuff in my head. I literally just had to listen to what he said and do it. And I, I, I think that what's up? I was gonna say I love that. And then uh, we had a good we had a good outing, and then you know the next night he he let me call some stuff, and and slowly but surely it got to be where we, you know, it it was both of us putting stuff together. Um, but yeah, I remember we were in uh, Manila at Araneta Coliseum in Manila, and I said, "What would you like to do tonight, sir?" And he goes, "Uh." Work my leg, and at some point, I'll drop you on your head. And that was it. And we went out and did, like, you know, 25 minutes or so. I had a blast. That's awesome. Because it's, it's, you know, you're just calling the fly, but it's the Undertakers, one of the, you know, one of the, the goats or whatever, one of, one of the, uh, the all-time greats. But that's great that you guys have the chemistry that he's trusting you, and he's like, yeah, we'll just call it out there. You know, it's very smooth. It is different, though, like working with a guy like that that is a legend – Who's, I mean, I didn't have to worry about anything. I don't necessarily know that things would have gone so well had I worked somebody who, who had less experience, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, although I did have some outings like that. I had a, an outing like that with Matt Hardy once where we were at TV. It was a SmackDown day. Segment one was in the ring. It was like King Booker and he was doing something. Booker T was doing something with all of his court. 
and uh and i was gonna work a local guy it was just gonna be like a squash match and matt hardy was working psychosis right after me and matt came around the corner the segment one is in the ring and i'm seg two and matt comes around the corner and goes ken we got a three segment match and we're up next and i was like uh i thought he was kidding at first and then johnny ace came around the corner and was like all right guys Let's come up with, we had to come up with a break spot because we had two commercial breaks and a finish. And they had it, uh, they added Shane Helms to commentary and we had to include him in the, on the finish. And then we literally had five minutes or less to put it together. And we just kind of went out there and walked and talked and, you know, working with a guy like Matt, he's, he's also up there with, you know, I'd put him on the same par as Undertaker as far as like being able to just go out there and work. That guy knows what he's doing. You know, he's a pro. What's that like the pressure wise? Like you don't know the situation. You don't know you're about to have this match and all of a sudden it's three segments. Then you said like the, the break. So you have to have a, some sort of spot for the break. And then, I mean, that's got to be a lot of pressure just thrown on you like that. It's like your butthole puckers real quick. <laughs> and then you got to like, all right, man, I, this is what we're doing. Like I've either got to sink or swim here. So we're going to do this. And then you get out there and once you lock up, usually all those nerves kind of go away and you're, all right, we're good. We're good. So <laughs> that was so, one of my uh, fondest experiences. So Johnny Ace is helping you guys lay out the match. Yeah, he was our producer. Um, and I guess it was just Vince was sitting in gorilla position and he just happened to look at the card and went, what, why is this happening? And, and then he threw out those matches and he said, like, tell those two to go out there and give them three segments and tell them to tear the house down. Um, it's almost like they trusted you guys. Though. It's like, we're going to throw them out, throw them out there, give them no warning, but we trust them yeah. enough that they could pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And I, I feel like we delivered too. It was good. It's probably one of my favorite matches I've ever had. Wow. Really? Yeah. And it was, uh, like I said, little stress because we didn't have time to stress about it. We didn't have time to think about a bunch of spots. Matt and I had worked with each other enough. And that's the, that's another thing about working for WWE um, or even impact when we were on, when we were doing live events is that you work with the same guy week after week after week. And you sort of start to like iron out the kinks and there's most nights, you know, we, Matt and I worked each other for months. We didn't have to talk. We would literally would just lock up in the ring. And we knew what we were doing, you know. Almost you could go when they're blind, you know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. And then the, the thing is, is like the, where that improv comes in is being able to, like, if you just go out there and you paint my numbers entirely and like you do something and the crowd's not reacting to it, you got to be able to adjust a little bit on the fly and see, okay, we'll give them a little of this and see if they're biting on that stuff. Um, or you just, motor straight through and the whole match is terrible you know i feel like too if it's too segmented where you know what you're doing it's very robotic i feel like the crowd knows and they they're not as into it you know what i mean it's, it's so predictable yes yep people it, it's just like bad acting um bad acting is where you can tell like somebody's reading it off a script instead of listening listening to the other actor as though it was the first very first time they're ever hearing it i think we're actors i mean we are we are somebody can't just a script and says go out there and be this person you know emote so do you think like calling it in the ring though is passe because it seems like you know, as far as like a lot of what we see on TV, it seems like it is very much they're going it over in the back. Like it seems like it's very cookie cutter. That is, um, well, I mean, that's just the way it is nowadays. I think because of the TV environment, like WWE is, uh, especially at TVs, everything's laid out. Everybody has to know. Um, um, I think it's changed a little bit just recently where it's not completely cookie cutter, especially with the promo. I've heard that like, you know, hunters allowing guys a little more freedom to say what they want in their, in their speeches, you know, like in their promos, he just gives them bullet points and says like, as long as you get here, you say it like you would say it. Um, 
But I, I don't know, man. I, I think calling in the ring, and, and I've had this experience at the school, and I've done that. Usually Tuesdays and Thursdays are our advanced night, and we pair up people up and we give them, you know, we put them in matches, whether they're tag teams or three ways or whatever. And, uh, and there have been a, a few times where I've just said, okay, you and you hop in the ring. Give me six minutes. And they're stressed out at first. And like I said, once they, once they lock up and take that first bump, they usually like smooth out and everything goes. I, I would dare say that the matches are better on those nights than they are when I give them an hour to put their stuff together. It's crazy. Yeah. That's weird. Can, right. Can that you is... hang on one second? I'm sorry. I think yep. my, I think I locked my cat in the door in the room over here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear her screaming in the <laughs> I've, I've done that before. I'm like, where the hell's that noise coming from? Like, oh shit, the cat. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought I would be a cat person. Here yeah, I me am. neither. Me neither. I was always a dog person growing up. Do you have cats? One cat, yeah. Yeah, my wife came home. My wife came home from work one day or she called me and she said like, Hey, I did something. You're probably going to be mad at me. And I had the kids with me. We went and picked her up. And, uh, she came walking out with this tiny little thing and the kids started crying. Oh my God. We love it. We love it. And she got in the car. My wife got in the car and she's like, just for a couple of days, just to see if, you know, it's something that we, uh, seeing if it's a good fit. And I just looked at my wife, like, yeah, we're keeping the damn cat. <laughs> and I, it, the thing is awesome. I just love it. About ten years ago or so, uh, this girl just walks up to me. She goes, "Is that your cat?" And I thought she was joking because we're like in the middle of a complex, and it was under the car. I'm like, first of all, it was you know this tiny, so I don't know how she even saw it to begin with. But I'm like, "Is that my cat? What the hell is she talking about?" Then, then she starts running out the cat, and she gives me a towel. She goes, "Here." So I I grabbed it up real quick and put it in the towel. And the girl's like, do you want to keep it or should I keep it? And I was like, and we, you know, we, you make eye contact with the cat. I'm like, I'll keep it. I'll take it to the vet. So I called my wife and I'm like, um, hey, uh, I just picked up this cat. I'm going to drop him off at the vet. She's like, yeah, right. Drop him off. We're keeping her or whatever. And then 10 years later, we stole the cat. It's crazy. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And then like, the best part is the, um, the maintenance, you know, there's no maintenance really. Like, you gotta clean the litter box. That's it. Feed them. Yeah. Yep. But otherwise, they just take care of themselves. And you, the only thing, though, is like when you, like, hey, come here, Stripe, come here, come here. And she'll just look at you like you're nuts. Yeah. But then 30 minutes later, when you're not paying attention, when you don't want her to sit on you or whatever, you don't care, like, she'll come and sit. It's always, always on their terms. But I kind of like that. Yeah, me too, oddly, because I've, I've noticed that about my cat. It's like, oh, come here, come here. Nope. And then if I'm busy, scratching my leg, rubbing up, it jumps on my lap. It's it's like they're in charge, not you. Yep. It's it's them. Yep. But it's kind of, um, you know, it's I think it's a good lesson for my, for my kids, too, that, like, you just got to let them, you know, you can't force the situation. You can't force someone to like you. Like, you just – Back off, they'll come to you, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, you got to let them be. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're harder than dogs because as far as like personality ways, because dogs kind of like you no matter what. Cats is like, eh, maybe, you know what I mean? They, they're they tough. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, with the dog, you got to take him out a couple times a day. You got to clean yep. up after him. Like, yep. Yeah. And the cat behaves himself too. Yeah. I'm very glad we have a cat instead of a dog right now. <laughs> She's cheaper too. I mean, to, to yes. her dog food and everything else is expensive, and yeah, the yeah, leashes right. and the chains yeah. and all the other nonsense. No, yeah. yours doesn't go outside, that does she? No, no, no. She wants to though. She sits and looks outside out the window, like. And then every time I come home, I have to make sure to you know shield the the way. Oh, well, now she's got the zoomies too. So yes. We have yeah. a crazy cat lady that lives like by us, and the, they, she always has like cats roaming around. So I, I know my cats like looking at them, like watching them out the window, thinking like, "Oh, I kind of want to hang out with them, or or maybe see what they're up to." But she yeah. never goes outside. Thank God. She doesn't. 
No, no. Yeah, my cat definitely wants to. I can see it. Uh oh, watch out! Just, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know what would happen. And it's it's getting cold here. Where do you live? New Jersey, Asbury Park. Okay, yeah. So it's it's about to get cold here. So she wouldn't last long out there. She's a little cat. Yeah, it's probably freeze going to be freezing where you are, right? I mean, it's probably like one degree soon. It'll be, yeah, it'll be. Uh, last year, I think we had like negative twenty with the wind chill on wow. a couple couple days. It's I don't know. Every year, I think, why do I live here? Like, <laughs> I I could live anywhere in the world, really. I and I I truly could. Um, I could live in any country, just about. Um, but I guess you know I've got kids. So <laughs> I'll stay here for uh, for at least ten more years. Yeah, until they're done with school, right? Yep. Well, then I think I'm moving. Just we're well, winding back though. I'm always curious. Like, how do you get on for you particularly? How do you get on WB's radar? Like, I know you go get to OVW, but how does that all happen? Like, who spots you? Who kind of recruits you? Who sees you? Is that like Heyman sees you, or does somebody see you on like an indie scene? Like, how do you get kind of recruited in? I think everybody's got a different story, which is very cool. Um, but my particular story was I started sending tapes to the WWE. I remember I, I picked up a magazine. It, it was like uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated or something like that. And it had uh, the, the phone numbers and addresses for all the wrestling companies in the country or most of them. You know, like, and it was the, you know, first couple pages was how to contact WWF and WCW, ECW. And then it was all these little indies underneath. And uh, I, I remember I sent a tape to WWE and I sent a tape to WCW, sent one to ECW. And I got a call back a week later from Kevin Kelly, who was in charge of extras at the time for WWE. And uh, he's like, you know, he brought me in for a, for a match. And I ended up, uh, I don't think the, the first time it was, uh, it was two days of work. It was Raw and SmackDown because Raw was on Monday. And then they would tape SmackDown on Tuesday. So I think it was Milwaukee and Chicago. And I didn't do anything. I just hung out and ate catering. And I believe I got to get in the ring at some point. It was just kind of roll around with some of the other local guys. Um and then, and then I just started, I kept in contact with him and I kept sending tapes and every time that I'd see they were in the area, I remember like, uh, I saw they were going to be in Cleveland and Detroit and I reached out to him and I said, you know, it's a drive for me, but I don't care. And he, he said, okay, if you want to do it, make the drive. And then I ended up driving to Cleveland by myself and I worked SA Rios. That was my very first match that I had with WWE. Um, you know, as an extra anyways. And then uh, the next night I went to Detroit and I was an extra in a segment with, uh, like I was a cop. And then I remember my, my gun belt fell off at some point <laughs> during the segment. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I just kept doing that. And I would go and I'd try to be a sponge as much as I could and just you know, I didn't want to be annoying, but I also wanted to make sure that people knew that I was there. And um, I just kept doing that. I did that for six years. And slowly but surely, you know, people start to remember you and recognize you. And I had a couple decent matches. And so they knew that I was that I understood that my job was to make their guys look good, not to get there, you know, not to get myself over. I think that's that's interesting. Um that a lot of people, even workers in the company, don't realize that like nobody is impressed by your cool moves and like they're impressed by, by you doing your job well. And if that means that your job is to go out there and make Bra like Braun Strowman look like an absolute animal maniac and you do a good job of that, the people that are in charge backstage – are watching the monitor and they know what you're doing. They can see it. And that is more impressive to them than cool moves and stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and so that was, I think I was able to do that. And, and I just got to know a ton of different people, Dr. Tom, 
Paul Heyman at some point like took an interest in me when I was there. Um, Tommy Dreamer, I got to know him. Then then Davari got signed before I did, and uh, you know he helped me a lot. Then Arn Anderson was also uh, in my corner, and and suddenly all those all those things just clicked into place at once, and it seemed like it took forever. And I remember the entire time, that entire six year process, I was like, I just want to, I just want to be signed. I just want to be signed. And then when it took me that long, when I finally got there, I was so happy that it had taken me six years to do so, you know, just because of all that I had learned that I felt, okay, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm where I need to be right now. Experienced enough. Yep. That first night when I went out and they said um, it was supposed to be a dark match against Unaki. And when Dave Lagana came around the corner, I was in gorilla position doing push-ups, and he came and he says, like, there's been a change to the match. I thought he was going to tell me that the match was scrapped. And he said, um, we have to figure out a finish for you because you're going over. You're going to win the match. And uh, he goes, welcome aboard, and stuck out his hand, you know. And I remember, like – not really being any more nervous. I was like, I'm going to go out there and do exactly what I was going to do five minutes ago when the finish was different. So, yeah, there's something to, to be said about having like all that experience. But, yeah, I was just fortunate in my case to just and, – and I'll tell you what, like I was, I was about ready to like – I should start looking for something else to do, you know? Cause it had been six years and I was just like, I was struggling financially and I was like, how much more can I do? I was 27, I think. So. One of those things you're like, wow, this might be the, the last straw for me. If it's, if, if it's not now, it's never, you know? Yeah. And I, I remember too, um, after I remember Davari called me up one day and he goes, Hey, just be, be on the lookout, answer your phone. Because WWE is, they're hiring right now. They're they are hiring some people. They just hired a bunch of people that were down at OVW. So they, they had hired a bunch of people that were in the amateur class at OVW. And he said, just sit tight. And I remember I waited. I waited all weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday, nothing. Tuesday, nothing. And I, I told myself, if I don't hear anything by Wednesday, I'm going to call. And so I called, uh, I remember I was on my lunch break. I called Tommy Dreamer and I said, uh, hey, Tommy, this is Ken Anderson from Green Bay. And he would normally say, uh, hello, Ken Anderson from Green Bay. I'm busy. I'll call you back. And then he never would call me back. Right. But uh, my wife just fell down the stairs. Are you okay, honey? <laughs> She's <laughs> laughing. So... Uh... <laughs> And he just said, um, he would normally say, I'm, I'm busy. I will call you back. And then he ne would never call me back. Yep. And uh, he just said, hang on a second. And I heard him shuffling some papers around. And he's like, I've been trying to call you for several days now, but your, your number has been disconnected. And I was like, uh, no, 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 it's <laughs> not. And I'm he said, you for that number. is your number blah, 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 blah. I said, no. He goes, oh, I've been calling the wrong number. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm glad you called because I was just about ready. Like, I, he, he was giving me a couple more hours and then he was going to go on to the next person, but he was calling to tell me that I got a job. Wow. So yeah. Dreamer was the guy. Dreamer the, was the at, guy. At that who, point. At that point, yep. Yep. Talent relations or whatever you want to call it. Yep. Wow. Imagine if uh, you didn't call. Right, right. I uh, maybe I, I don't know what would happen either. Like I, I was at that breaking point, you know, like where I was like, oh, this might be it. This is the last straw. But who knows? Crazy. And what number was he calling? What the hell? Where did he get that I information don't, from? No, no. He was like, it was one number off. It was one number off. So he uh, had the wrong number sent off. Yeah. Damn. That's yeah. crazy. Could have been changed forever. Why the change to Kennedy? Kennedy, you know, like um, why did they make that change? Yeah, it was my first two weeks on TV. They let me 
you know, I was Anderson on Velocity. And then I remember getting to TV and Johnny pulled me aside and he's like, hey, Vince wants to talk to you. He wants to change your name. And uh, I was kind of bummed about it. But I really didn't care. I mean, it wasn't a hill that I was willing to die on. And when we got in the room, it was um, it was me, Vince, Stephanie, Kevin Dunn, Johnny. I think that's it. And um, you know, we were they were asking questions and stuff. And uh, um, they said, "Thank you." Honey. They said, um, "Vince." Vince said, uh, "The reason he goes the Anderson is a." Uh, Anderson is like, you know, that Arn Anderson, Oli, and he said, like, I don't want people thinking that you are related to them. And I think it was twofold. It was one, you know, he's very anti, like Randy Orton is one of the only people that I can think of. Cody Rhodes, but you've got like Axel, uh, Joe Hennig, you know, yep. Ac Curtis, Curtis Axel. Axel. Yep. You've got a dad like Kurt Hennig. And you change your name and like Ron Breaker right now, you know, with a name like Steiner. But, you know, he's just so he's very that's just me Vince's mentality. He doesn't want anybody thinking that the only reason you're there is because of your name. And plus, I also think part of him didn't know how I was going to do. And yeah, he didn't want me to tarnish the name, the Anderson name, potentially. So. He just, like, I kind of, I didn't argue with him, but I, like, pleaded my case a little bit. And he just said, like, no, we're going to want to change the name. And I had talked to Paul Heyman earlier in the day. And I told him, like, this is what the, he wants to change my name. So he had, it was Paul that had come up with the name Kennedy. I had wanted to keep it KK. Like, I wanted to keep the alliteration because I was Kamikaze Ken on the Independence. And I had these, like, this logo. And I sort of wanted to keep that logo. And uh, so we were trying to think of K names. And then he goes, K Kennedy's Vince's middle name. And uh, and when I, you know, when I pitched it to him, he liked it. And that was it. Obviously, you're going to keep the Anderson, Kennedy. Was that a part of it, too? You wanted to make sure it was three syllables? You know, I I think that probably we probably had something... I'm sure we thought that out because I was doing the Anderson thing, Rick. Yeah. I'm sure that had something to do with it. So when you're doing that and, and you're, you're talking to Vince, are you nervous? Like I might say the wrong thing or like, or you, you're cool under pressure with that. I was, I, I wasn't, I like, I, I felt like I belonged there at the time. It was just weird. Like I, I had worked really hard to get to that point And I was like, I'm, this is where I need to be. And uh, that first that first year was just like it was crazy. It was crazy. It was a whirlwind. I was just telling somebody last night. I was talking to. Um, I went to. I went to Raw last night. I was talking to Austin Theory, and I just said like that first the four years that I was at WWE was an absolute blur. There's things that I did that I don't even remember doing that I'll see a video of where somebody will remind me, and it's you know. It's just nuts. That's how fast, I guess, you know, it, it goes by for you. That's just crazy because it's like, wow, four years. But it just – it goes by in a, in a, in a flash, in a heartbeat. It, it's just a blink. And you, the thing is, is you're in a different town every single night. So you don't really have time to th stop and think about it. It's just go, 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 go. Doing one town, kill it, on to the next. And then Ooh. you get home and you have like a day and a half off. And you're back on the road. And, you know, it's just, it is a whirlwind. And then in addition to doing all that, you're doing extra stuff. When you get to TV, you're do doing photos and pictures and like other interviews and phone interviews and, and, uh, you know, you're getting scanned for toys and you're getting, you're doing voiceovers for video games and all kinds of stuff. There's just always something going on. I just saw a cool toy of yours. Uh, somebody had it in a store, the one with the microphone, and you're holding the microphone. I was like, wow, that's an awesome, an awesome figure. A really cool yeah. figure, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like that little statue. Yeah. There, yeah. I still like it. I still pinch myself a little bit. Like, I, I have action figures. It's just crazy, you know? I always wanted to. I'm a video gamer. 
And that was, I couldn't wait to be in a video game. And uh, I came home. I remember I, when, when it came out finally, I think it was SmackDown versus Raw, Raw versus SmackDown 2006 or 2007. And uh, I came home and I plugged it in. And I played for about 10 minutes and that was it. I was done. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it's awesome. You're in the game. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Whose idea is that microphone thing, by the way? Because that figure is awesome, that statue thing. But whose idea is that? Is that just a Vince thing or is that your idea? It was one of the writers, and I, I hate that I can't. I feel like such an asshole because I can never remember the person's name. Um, it was one of the writers at the time. For years, I thought it was Dave Lagana's idea because Dave was the one that pitched it to me. He's like, hey, you know, we had this idea of a microphone coming down from the ceiling, like the old school. Um boxing announcers and uh yeah but it was uh, one of the one of the writers at the time and i remember just a few years ago going to um i had a wrestling show that i was doing in miami with uh, legends of wrestling it's brian knobs gets a bunch of old uh, wrestling legends together he was uh i think we were at a casino or something like that and uh Dreamer happened to be on that show and he invited me and my wife to go to a hockey game. And uh, at the hockey game, he's like, we're in a box. And uh, he introduced me. He's like, hey, this is the guy that came up with your idea, your microphone idea. And I was like, I had no idea. So up until that point, I had no idea that it was that it was that guy. So I always thought it was Dave Lagana. Dave's taking credit there for. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he was. Uh, yeah, I he never corrected it, but uh, <laughs> I don't think it was nefarious. So you said, obviously, Undertaker, we talked about before, you feuded with him. I mean, it is a whirlwind, but you're getting a good substantial TV time. You're getting a nice push. You know, they're using you in a great way. Did you think, like, there was going to be more to it as far as, like, higher on the card kind of thing? Because at one point, you're the Money in the Bank winner, and it seems like you're going to get a title shot at Mania, and then, like, kind of everything changes. So did you expect more want more uh did you think there was going to be more as far as up the up the ladder there was going to be more um you know there were big plans but i i you know injuries injuries plagued me as well as um my mouth my own mouth you know like i got myself in a ton of trouble and looking back on that like it's you know i can take credit for all that um but yeah, there was definitely. I, I remember there was going to be a. Uh, it called me in the office at some point and told me like, "Hey, you're going to cash your briefcase in on Undertaker next Tuesday when we tape SmackDown." And the next time I wrestled, I thought I tore my tricep, and so like, I went in and I dropped the briefcase to Edge because they. they the thing was is that Undertaker was injured at the time. He had torn his biceps. So they needed to get it off of him. And that was the only way they could think of, apparently. Um, so, yeah, I, I went in and I dropped the briefcase to Edge. And then I flew down to Birmingham. And I sat on Dr. Andrew's table and found out that it wasn't a tear, that it was just a just like a large bruise. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of changed my trajectory there. But, uh, you know. And there was a, the time that I was going to be Vince's kid, and then I got in trouble for the, you know, the steroid, uh, the signature pharmacies thing. Yep. No, so it was like every time the ball would start rolling, I would either get injured or, or I would do myself in. So. Did you almost want to tell him, "Hey, guys, not really hurt. Let's go. Let's revisit this. You know, I'm I'm okay." As far as like the money in the bank thing. I mean, it was already. At that point, I think it was already done. I had I had already dropped the briefcase to oh, Edge, okay. you know, because I was – the plan was I dropped the briefcase to Edge on Monday on Raw, and then Tuesday he goes and cashes it in on Taker. And then Tuesday – I Tuesday was when I flew down to Birmingham, and it was like Tuesday afternoon. So, it, like, I would have never been able to, to make it back in time. And plus, I literally couldn't move my arm. It wasn't like, you know, that's the whole reason why if you watch that match between Edge and I, it's he beats me up before the bell even rings. 
he rolls me in the ring and it's basically like one spear, I think. And, and that was it. It was just because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move my arm. Did you ever kind of not regret that you got hurt? I mean, obviously there's nothing you could do about it, but almost like think to yourself, man, I, I, I kind of sucks. That I didn't get back to that point. Cause they were almost going to put the strap on me. Yeah. I, I remember thinking at the time, like, I'll just, I'll be back. It'll be all right. You know, um, it's just, you know, that's one thing about this business. When you're rolling you 52 weeks a year, you don't, there's no off season. It's like injuries are bound to occur, especially rolling four or five nights a week sometimes. Or if you're doing overseas tours, it's sometimes seven nights a week, you know, depending on the, the length of the tour. I remember one time, I, I swear we did a 21 day tour between, we did a, a tour in the States. Like we did a bunch of house shows Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we did a super show on Monday. We flew to England and then we started like a nine day tour over there and we wrestled in a different city and every single day. And then we came back and we finished it out with TV here, I think. So it was just this really lengthy tour. And it was, a, like I said, we had one, maybe one day where we didn't wrestle out of that whole so when you have that kind of that kind of schedule, it's just injuries are going to happen. Man, what a schedule! Jeez, Louise, yeah, <laughs> and up in all those was, things. And, our, and honestly, like we had it easy compared to the guys 10, 20 years before me. Yeah, yep. They were sometimes working twice a night, and yeah, those yeah. Hogan years when they were living on those shows, those house shows. And they say that the ring ring was super stiff too. Like it was not fun to bump in. Oh man, you watch some of those matches. I guess you know because so the guys were bigger, so they're trying to be more support. But you know, like Brett and the Bulldog or something. You see, it's like it's boom, no give. It's like oh yep. man, like that's gotta hurt. Shit. Yeah. Yep. It's just crazy. When you look at like online rumors and stuff, any of that stuff true or or not true? Like Randy Orton issues john cena issues like you said you had a little bit of a mouth problem is that any of that true as far as those guys um um yeah yeah but like i think i think the thing that people fail to realize is that with everything there's nuance you know mm. it's not all black and white yeah ever so there's like, and I guess I've, I've stated this before, like if I don't say anything, then people are able to just run wild with their imaginations and they do. And if I say too much, then I'm being defensive. So I just, I, I for the most part, you know, like I, I just, I'll take credit for that stuff. Yes, there was uh, issues between us, but I mean, I will say that. I will own the the responsibility behind those things. And um like I've never spoken to John since uh, since leaving, but I've spoken with Randy and we had a really good, you know, good conversation. Everything seemed to be just fine. Um and we're, you know, he's a different person now, I'm a different person now. It's been I left there in 2009, so it's been what 13 years. So, yeah, um, I, I definitely think that after I left WWE, when I went to TNA, I had a big chip on my shoulder, like huge chip. And for the longest time, I couldn't take, I couldn't take ownership for the things that I did. And, uh, I feel like I, I definitely blamed other people for my downfall and like looking back at it, like, I, and I'm not just saying that to be the guy that takes ownership. Like I, I truly look back and see, I had my foot on, I had this amazing opportunity and I took my damn foot off the gas pedal. I really did. Um, and I, and I coasted and, uh, and I'm the only thing that I can do now is help my students not make the same mistakes. Right. Hopefully. Hopefully. Although, right. you know, you tell your kids not to touch the stove and they got to touch it, right? Yep. 
So. Oh man, so true. And I think a lot of people remember like the time in WWE. It's like, man, what could have been with Ken Kennedy? But they also remember, I think, a, a ton of people because I, I mean, a, people always say it to me like Eddie Guerrero's last match, Eddie Guerrero's last match, like that, that, like so. That's like you have some obviously some good memories, but that's one of the things where it's like bittersweet to a certain extent, but a part of history to me. It's like, wow, like Eddie's last match. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I always that's it's such a strange sort of I don't know how I feel about that other than the fact that like I was just it's uh, I, I feel like sort of honored in a way that that was that that unfortunate part of history right like I'm I'm there but uh, I obviously I hate the fact that it was his last match um, he was only 38 years old he had so much more to give. He was an awesome human being. And the, just the fact that I got to be in the ring with him at all was uh, was phenomenal. So, yeah, just it, it just is what it is. We'll wind it down here. We'll head towards the finish. You mentioned TNA. I just wanted to kind of just go over that because it seemed like you definitely had a chip on your shoulder. But they were kind of making you the man, like two-time champion, like Sting, Jeff Hardy, RVD, I mean, whoever else is there. You're kind of the guy that they really were pushing it. Did you feel like you were the man at that point? Yeah, I mean i I knew that I was I, I knew that I was getting a good push. Um, I, again, though, like I was in this weird headspace, and I was my own worst enemy. Even when I was, even when they handed me the ball. I still got in my own way. I remember doing an interview like right after I had won the title. I can't remember if it was the first time or the second time that I'd won the title, but like I, I did an interview and they asked me, you know, what do you see yourself doing in 10 years? And I was like, if I'm wrestling in 10 years, please somebody shoot me or something like that, you know, or if I'm doing this in five years, please shoot me. And then I said something to the effect of like, um, that, we people politic and backstab each other over a toy belt is basically what I said, wow. you know, because like at the end of the day, that like there are writers that write who's going to win and who's going to lose. Like, that's just a fact of, um, and uh, I just shouldn't have said it. And, and there was so much more like nuance that I would have spoken about. But I just blurted that out. And of course, like if if I'm the owner of the company, but I just put the title on this guy and he's saying that like it's basically calling it a toy title and saying that people are backstabbing each other over this thing. Like and uh I think they they immediately like, oh okay, we'll take that from you then. <laughs> right. So, so almost lose a little bit of trust in you after that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But it really was, I I really did have like the worst chip on my shoulder and I couldn't take ownership for what I had done in leaving WWE. Looking back, is that like the big regret? Like maybe, maybe not having the maturity or like, what, what do you think? Is that the, just like the big regret in your career? Like I should have done it differently, could have done it differently. You know, it could have, should have, would have kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, like part of me just says, I, I can't. You know, I can only control what I do moving forward and how I react to the past. Um, but there is that part that what would you have done differently? And there's a ton that I would have done differently. Um, and I guess I just at some point I, re- I remember having matches with people on TV and just thinking and not being excited about it. Like like Shawn Michaels working with Shawn Michaels or working with Ric Flair and like, yeah, it's just another job. I'm punching the clock here. It was just so weird. Now, now looking back at it, I'm like, I, I did what? Um, just the, that sort of mentality. And I, I wish I hadn't been in that headspace. And I, I don't, I can't quite wrap my finger around, like, why I got there. Or how I was able to get there, you know? To go from, you know, that first year that I was in WWE, even the first two years I was in WWE, it was like, they put the rocket ship on me, so to speak. Like I, I really was getting pushed and, uh, and to go from 
just uh, always wanting to put my best foot forward to just, like I said before, punching the clock. It's just a weird, weird thing. Yeah, it's almost like you're there. You, you know, you're not on top of the mountain, but you know, you're you're at the peak of where you want to be. It's WWE. It's it's the it's the big leagues. I'm wrestling Michaels and Undertaker and Flair, but you weren't particularly happy. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just it is what it is. I, I like I said, I can only uh, I can only tell these stories to my students and and have con- these conversations with them. I've got, you know, some of my students have had WWE tryouts. I've had a couple who have passed through our doors who are now working in AEW and NXT. And um, I just, I always try to pull them aside and say, look, man, like, this is what I did. Just try to avoid this if you can. And I try to do it in a way that, you know, because like I said before, you tell your kid not to touch the stove and they got to touch the stove. Um, I, I try to make it sound like I'm not lecturing them, but I just be as I'm just as open and honest with them as I possibly can be. So what's next for you? Are you still going to be wrestling or are you just training and just doing the academy? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm running the academy five nights a week and then I'm taking bookings here and there. And, uh, you know, I got some other things that I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm working on getting my ass back in shape. So, uh, I don't think I'm done wrestling yet. Um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I'm Where working can, on a couple things. Nice. I like that. Where can everybody find the Academy and, you know, website, social media, all that other stuff, even for you. Yeah. Um, uh, you can, uh, email us at the Academy S O P W at gmail.com. Um, you can also, uh, you can find us on, uh, Twitter and Facebook, the Academy SOPW. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, on Twitter, it's Mr. Ken Anderson, Mr. Ken Anderson on Instagram. It's Mr. Spelled out M I S T E R. Um, on Facebook, um, it's just Ken Anderson. It's just my. I got hair, and I should probably change my uh, profile pic because I recently, I just I couldn't I couldn't uh, I couldn't fight it anymore. You're going to like the aces and ace look there. It was when, uh, <laughs> when you were in aces and ace. Yeah. Well, it was like uh, it was thinning up here, and I just thought like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight it. I'm just gonna had a big bald spot growing on the back of my head, so I figured I'd just get rid of it. I it saved that- me a lot, and uh, I don't have to go to the barber anymore. Yeah, that's yeah, true. That, mine is too. You just shave it off. You save you some time and money. Yeah, yeah. One last thing though, do you still have the voice? Uh yeah, yeah, it's still there. It's still there. I can still hit it. <laughs> Kennedy or Anderson? Either one, I guess. Right? Either, either one. Either. either one. I um, you know, I prefer. I wish that I had never been Kennedy. Um. I wish that I'd been able to use my my real name the entire time. And it's funny how people will come up to me and say, like, oh, I liked you better when you were Kennedy. I'm like, I I didn't change anything. <laughs> like <laughs> I did the right. same thing. It's just the last name is different. But you know, it's just funny how people people latch on to certain things. But I people ask me that all the time, Kennedy or Anderson, I'm like uh, you can call me whatever you want as you know. Hey, I kind of like them both because they did the three syllable thing. It works. You know what I mean? You yeah. can do both. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But Ken, thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Anytime.